Well, good morning, everybody. I don't know whether it's the cold weather or what, but uh, we were singing pretty good this morning. Like, I really enjoyed that. I, I could hear you louder than my full back, so, so I, I, I don't know to what it was, but um, yeah, it's wonderful. Just great to be gathering and to hear the people of God sing the praises of God that we so much need to be reminded of. And uh, we have a classic passage before us this morning that hopefully, by God's Spirit, we'll see that continuing. Um, if you don't know me, my name's Tony, I'm one of the pastors here and it's my privilege uh, to bring us God's Word this morning. We're continuing our series in the book of Acts, which we've called Sent. And we've based that title on the kind of one of the key opening verses of the book of Acts, uh, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, where Jesus says to his disciples, And you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses. You will be my sent ones. You will go into the world to witness to the world of me, empowered by my spirit. And this is the calling of every follower of Jesus. If you know and love him this morning, then you are like me to be a sent one. Uh, If you don't yet know Jesus, but you come to Jesus and come to know him by his grace through what he's done for you on the cross and in his uh, resurrection, then you will also not only know him, but you'll be sent by him to bear witness to him in the world. But the question that ought to immediately rise for us is the question, how? How am I going to be his witness? How am I going to do that? Because if we're honest, we're probably much more prone to stay than go or than be sent. We're far more likely, humanly speaking, to settle in and get comfortable rather than reach out, uh, particularly if it's going to cost us in some way. Well, unless, of course, I'm the only one with that tendency here this morning, but I'm going to go out on a limb here and say I'm not. You see, the reality is this, living for Jesus, living as sent ones, is actually humanly impossible. And we need to get that straight. Living for Jesus, living on mission for Jesus, is actually humanly impossible. Uh, Becoming a Christian in the first place is humanly impossible. You will not do it in and of yourself. You will not come to a place of knowing that you cannot save save yourself, not even that your best efforts, not even the best version of you is ever going to be close enough to be saved by God. To be saved by God is humanly impossible. You need Because you need to come to a place and realise that your sins are actually against God, deserving of his just judgment, and that what he has done for you on the cross through his son Jesus is your only but awesome hope of salvation. So that's just becoming a Christian. Then living for Jesus is exactly the same. It's humanly impossible. For you and I to become more and more like him, to be transformed deeply in such a way that we're changed from the very core of our being uh, and, and that then kind of that comes out in the fruit of a changed life, that also is humanly impossible. I hope you're not getting too discouraged at this point. And then, of course, being on mission for Jesus, living as one sent by him, joyfully advancing the gospel, no matter the cost for the salvation of others, reaching our region and beyond... The 200,000 people in the city of Goslins and the city of Armadale, humanly impossible, right? So how is the right question to ask? How can we live as sent ones? Well, the good news is this. God is in the business of making the humanly impossible an undeniable reality. God is in the business of supernaturally saving sinners through his son, Jesus. That's what he does. God is in the business of then supernaturally transforming those he has saved through Jesus. 
And he's also in the business, as we've seen already in the book of Acts, of supernaturally sending, sending those he has saved to live on mission for Jesus. We've seen it in Acts so far, and we're going to see it again in our passage today. So turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 9, and we're going to read uh, from verse 1 through to verse 31. Beware, as we read this passage, for, for some of you, it may be a very familiar story. But we don't want it to be familiar this morning. We want it to be fresh, brought home to us by God's Spirit for His glory and for our good. So let's read it, try and read it with fresh eyes. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus. So that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, not surprising, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed. And entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road to Damascus by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he arose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him. For they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Let's pray. 
<clears throat> Father, we thank you so much for the record that you have uh, preserved for us of how you intervened in the life of Saul and rescued him and commissioned him into your work. And we pray now as we look at it for a while together and unpack it, that we would see implications for our own lives, that we would be encouraged, challenged, strengthened, that we would see you more clearly, Lord Jesus, and we would love you more dearly. We ask this in your name. Amen. Well, it's probably helpful for us as we've read that story of Saul's conversion just to think a little bit about the context and who he is. Who was Saul? Uh, He is Saul of Tarsus. Uh, He is understood to be one of the greatest uh, or most influential people of all time. And that's not just in biblical biblical kind of circles. In secular historians, you will find uh, that to be the case, that he is considered incredibly influential. in in all of time. He's born a Roman citizen uh, in the city of Tarsus to parents who were Jewish and he was raised under strict Jewish teaching. Uh, He excelled at that. He went to the best school in Jerusalem and he studied under the famous uh, teacher Gamaliel. Uh, And because he was raised in such a way, of course, he was absolutely doggedly committed to monotheism, that is that there is one God and one God only. He would have said every single day of his life, the Shema, it found in Deuteronomy, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. That would have been his daily kind of existence. And then to hear that there is some people around. In fact, there was a man around who claimed that he is God. And now there are people who are proclaiming and spreading this this, uh, heresy, if you like, around that Jesus is God. This is to Paul anathema or to Saul. It's, It's just an abomination. It must must be stopped. Now he has strong, the strongest of religions, religious convictions on this front, and so he will do anything to anyone to protect those convictions and to stop this movement. And that's exactly what he did. That's what we find him doing here in Acts chapter 9. And in fact, that's what he was doing uh, before his life was so radically changed. He describes it himself later in the book of Acts. I've lost the passage. I'm just going to read it to you. Acts 26, verse 9 to 11. Here's his own testimony of what he was like before uh, he encountered Jesus. He says, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them and I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. That is, he's trying to make them say Jesus is God so that he has the evidence to condemn them. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities like Damascus, for example. And so here he is. Heading to Damascus, one of those foreign cities. He's got letters of authority. He's clear what he's going to do. He's going to stop anyone who is either part of this movement called the way or is proclaiming the one who this movement is centered around, that being Jesus. Humanly speaking, it doesn't look good for the church, does it? Humanly speaking... Living as those sent by Jesus seems like it could be short-lived. It mightn't last very long. And not only that, humanly speaking, Saul himself is the last person you would expect to become a follower of Jesus. But all of that suddenly changed, didn't it? Have a look at verse 3. And following through to verse 9. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly... A light from heaven shone around him. This is consistent with uh, what's called an epiphany, an appearing. 
a vision, a light from heaven shone around him and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city. You will be told what you are to do. All of a sudden, things changed. Jesus supernaturally intervened in Saul's life, making himself known to him. Think about this for a minute. The risen, glorious, reigning Lord Jesus stops him in his tracks with blinding light from heaven. It's kind of like you know Moses and the burning bush. It's in the same league as that. <laughs> no wonder Paul, Saul says, uh, who are you, Lord? And the response comes, I am Jesus. I am Jesus. Whom you are persecuting. Hang on a minute. Who's he persecuting? He's persecuting the church, isn't he? Jesus said, you're persecuting me. Just note the intimate relationship and connection between Jesus, the risen reigning Jesus and his people. You, if you're a follower of Jesus. All of a sudden, Saul has crystal clarity as to who he's dealing with, doesn't he? Crystal clarity. Though he is now physically blind, he has never seen so clearly until this moment. And surprisingly, Jesus doesn't destroy him, but rather instructs him to enter the city. But no longer will Saul do what he was going to do in that city with the followers of Jesus. He will now do what Jesus has planned for him to do for the glory of Jesus. Uh, those with Paul are clearly affected by this moment, uh, but the vision wasn't for them. So they hear a voice, but they don't see it. Uh, and Paul loses his sight. And so they, they lead him by the hand into the city. And Saul fasts and prays for three days. Again, another tradition that you, that you would do around encountering the living God. In verse 10 to 16, there's a second vision, which is easy for us to miss because we, we kind of see the first one and go, whoa, there's a second one. And this time it's to a man called Ananias. Jesus appears to him and says that he's to go to a particular house on a particular street and pray for Paul or Saul. Uh, not surprisingly, he's somewhat reluctant. <laughs> he's not that keen to go, given what he knows about Saul. Humanly speaking, this doesn't seem like a great idea, Jesus. But Jesus is clear. He is supernaturally intervening in Saul's life and he hasn't finished yet. And so verse 17 to 19, Ananias goes and Saul regains his sight and is filled with the Holy Spirit. And as a result, in response to all of that, he is baptized, declaring his faith in Jesus for all to see. What happens next? Well, again, that which is humanly impossible becomes an undeniable reality. Have a look at verse 19b and following. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus and immediately he does what? He proclaims Jesus in the synagogues, saying he is the Son of God. How did that happen? What a turnaround. Saul's persecuting Jesus and his people on the one hand. Now he's proclaiming Jesus with his people. That which is humanly impossible has become an undeniable reality. And notice he is now the object of persecution. He has, not, he has come here for this person. Saul increased uh, in strength. And then when that many days had passed, verse 23, the Jews plotted to kill him. Okay, so now he's in the firing line. Verse 31, we're told, kind of matter of fact, that the church grows. And uh, as a church, as the people of God, they're walking in the fear of the Lord, that is the reverence of the Lord and the comfort or strength of the Holy Spirit. And the church is 
multiplying. God is in the business of turning that which is humanly impossible into an undeniable reality. And here's a very, very clear demonstration of it. But how does that help us? How does that help us to live as sent ones, as we spoke about earlier? Sent by Jesus to bear witness to Jesus. I I mean, Saul's experience is unique, right? He's the apostle to the, the, the Gentiles. The whole light from heaven thing, the revealing of the glory of Jesus, Jesus directly addressing him and commissioning him into his service, pretty unique, right? Well, yes. And no. Yes, in terms of the specifics and the phenomena associated with this event. But actually, the key realities that happen here are the same for all of us if we would follow Jesus. If we would know God's salvation through him, if we would be transformed by him and become more like him, and if we would love him and live for him as those sent by him, these key realities are to be true for all of us. What key realities? Well, here's three. Three vital things for us to live as those sent by Jesus. Firstly, we need to come face to face with Jesus. Sounds pretty simple, I know. But we need to come face to face with Jesus. We, need, we must know, it's crucial that we know who it is we are dealing with when it comes to Jesus Christ. Because, friends, there are lots of Jesuses out there that are not this Jesus, that are not the Jesus of the Bible at all. Lots of Jesuses that we have created that are not the one who has been revealed. Here's just a couple of them. There's the teacher Jesus. Jesus is just a good teacher. In fact, he's the best teacher that there is. But he's no more than that. And salvation or being a Christian is just, you know, living by his teachings. We just need to live by the teachings of Jesus. That's not the Jesus that we see here. Yes, he is the best teacher ever. But he's so much more than that. Then there's the human Jesus. He's just a good man, a very good man, the best man that's ever lived. And Christianity is about kind of following his example and doing the best you can to be like Jesus. We just need to be like Jesus more and then God will accept us. Then we'll be in heaven. No, no, that's not the Jesus of the Bible. Yes, he is the best example ever, but he's far more than that. Then there's the religious Jesus that we've created. That is the Jesus, he's the Jesus that that says, well, we just need to go to church. Regularly, preferably. Uh, You know, participate fairly regularly. Pray sometimes, you know. Give occasionally. Make sure we do some good works. Maybe to balance up the things that we haven't done so well. That's the religious Jesus. And, And then God will accept us. We'll be in heaven. We'll be saved. No, that's not the Jesus of the Bible. That's the religious Jesus, one that we've created to make ourselves perhaps feel better. This is not the Jesus. None of those would be the Jesus that Paul was so upset about, right? That he was so desperate to stop. He wouldn't have bothered with any of them. It's definitely not the Jesus that Paul came face to face with. The same Jesus that we also need to come face to face with. Now, this Jesus is God who has become flesh, who is walking, um, who has walked among us, who has become one of us, and who has come as the Savior that we all need. This Jesus is, is God who does for us what we could never do for ourselves. That which is humanly impossible. This Jesus is God, the Son of God, who died for our sins. Yeah, that one who is in blinding glory went to the cross and made atonement 
for your sin and mine. Only he could do that. And more than that, he rose victorious over the grave in order to bring us life and life that never ends. I've quoted this before, but C.S. Lewis is so helpful at this point. Um, Young Susan is told that Aslan, the ruler of Narnia, is a great lion. Susan is surprised since she had assumed Aslan was a man. She then tells Mr. Beaver, I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion, she asks. She asks Mr. Beaver if Aslan is safe. To which Mr. Beaver replies, Safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king. Have you come face to face with King Jesus? Has he made himself known to you? He has made himself known. There were eyewitnesses of his glory. And we have their accounts. So you can come face to face with King Jesus. And it's so, so important that we do. Again, though Paul was struck with temporary blindness by the sheer glory of Jesus himself. He had never seen so clearly as he did face to face with Jesus. So if we're going to live for him and love him and live as sent ones by him, we must come face to face with him, which leads us to the second thing. Then we need to experience the stunning grace of Jesus. Because if you were Jesus, I wonder if I asked you this question, what would you say? What might you have done to Saul? What might you have done? Don't give me the nice answer. What might you have done to him? What might you have done with the one who was attacking and murdering those you love? What would you do if someone was harming the nearest and dearest to you? What would you do if that happened this afternoon? How would you respond? Do notice that Jesus probably didn't do what you or I would do. He didn't destroy Saul, though he would have been totally justified to do so. He didn't pour out his just judgment on Saul for his sins. He actually pours out his powerful grace on him. Do you see it? He saves him from his sin. And not only that, he gives him a place or a part to play in his mission. He invites him to, to join him in his work to bring salvation to all people. The blessing of God to the nations. What did he say to Ananias? Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. That's why we call it amazing grace, isn't it? Not just grace, but amazing grace. But it's so hard for us to actually grasp this. It's so hard for us to grasp the depth of God's grace. The magnitude of it. We're so familiar with the term. It's so often on our lips, isn't it? Grace this, grace that, grace something else. But it's not often gripping our hearts. Listen to how Paul, if the verse is there, listen to how Paul describes grace himself having experienced it. Oh, it's there. Look at that. Paul says, I thank him 
who has given me strength. Christ Jesus, our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and an insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy worthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Not surprising where he lands, right? To the king of the ages. Immortal, invisible, the only God. Be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. I wonder if you experienced the grace described here. The stunning grace of God. Is grace amazing personally to you? Yeah, sure, you and I might not, might not have per- persecuted the church. Well, I'm not aware if you have. Haven't noticed it. Though we may have been far from positive about the church and therefore far from positive about Jesus because remember, he's intimately connected to the the church. But apart from that, the Bible is clear. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And it's also clear that our sin is ultimately against God and therefore worthy of his judgment. Our sin is against the one that Paul met on the road to Damascus in blinding glory. And so it's incredibly serious, which is what makes grace all the more amazing. Just a little mathematic equation for you. If you dumb down sin... You dumb down grace. You think you're actually making things a bit better, but you're making things worse for yourself. In Narnia, Aslan is a lion, the king of all the animals whose roar is revered. And this image obviously comes from the book of Revelation, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the king. But it's not the only image found in Revelation, is it, in relation to Jesus? What's the other big one? He's the lamb. He's the lamb who was slain. The sacrifice that has been made for us. That's stunning. King of kings and the sacrifice for sinners. We need to come face to face with face to face with Jesus, the lion. But we need also to experience the stunning grace of Jesus, the lamb. Then the humanly impossible will become a reality in our lives. What is that? We'll actually begin to live as sent ones when those two things have happened. Which is exactly what happens for for Saul, isn't it? He starts to live for the name of Jesus. Everything for him becomes about the name of Jesus. Which is what Jesus said he was calling him to. For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles. His life would now be all about the name of Jesus. What does that even mean? Well, his life is going to be all about who Jesus is. Which he's now pretty clear about. As you would be. And his life is going to be all about what Jesus has done. And when I think of someone's name, it's not just a, you know, a typed font on a page, is it? When you think of someone's name. 
When you think of someone's name, you think about who they are and what they're like. Paul's, Saul's going to carry the name of Jesus. And earlier in the book of, ha- book of Acts, we've, we've heard that there is no other name given among humanity under heaven by which we must be saved. Oh, it's that name. This, this is not just a friend of mine who I think of and think about who they are. This is the name, the name that is above every name, the name that, at which every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. It's that name and Saul's going to carry that name wherever he goes. And Jesus is pretty upfront, as he is with us. It's not always going to be a walk in the park to carry the name of Jesus before others. I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Not everyone's going to welcome the good news of Jesus that he's going to bring with him. In fact, in some cases, it's going to cost him. We've already seen people trying to kill him. Fairly intense. But many will welcome the good news of Jesus that he brings to them. Many, through him, will come, to face, will come face to face with Jesus. And many will experience the stunning grace of Jesus through him. And many, like Paul, will end up living for Jesus. And this is where we get back to him being one of the most influential people of all time. Because many people have heard the name of Jesus because of him, because of God's grace in him, all the way right down to today. And we're still proclaiming the name of Jesus. And if you've put your hope in him, then you have experienced salvation through him. And you're called to live for him. So if you have come to face to, face to faith with Jesus, if you've ex- experienced the stunning grace of Jesus, you will actually want to live for the name of Jesus. It's going to be imperfectly. Just let me get, this is not about perfection here. This is about direction, the trajectory of your life. You're going to mess it up. You're going to live for yourself. Often, they're going to need to come and experience his grace fresh and have him set you going again, living for him. But that will be the trajectory. Speaking of trajectories, we've just made some bookings for a trip we're making to Ningaloo Station in October this year. A little excited, if you can't tell. Um, And some of that time is off-grid. And so there are some important things that we will need to carry with us. In fact, there's a list on the website, thankfully, because I probably would forget a number of things that I need to take, but it's all there. Just tick them off. Water, pretty big one. Food, it's another one. Gas, so on. But there is something we, will, we are to carry with us, all of us, as followers of Jesus. Wherever we go. See what it is. It's not just Saul who gets to carry the name of Jesus. It's all his people for all time. That's what it means to be sent. To carry the name of Jesus. We get to do that. That's meant to be Received as a privilege. Sometimes we see it as a burden. But it's meant to be a privilege. Wherever you go, whatever you do. I wonder do you need to come face to face with Jesus today? I know I do. Maybe for the first time today. How wonderful would that be? You've seen him in the scriptures. He's made himself known to you today. He's, he's shown you what he's like. 
Will you come face to face with him? Even if it's a little exposing of your own heart and your shortcomings and sins. Or maybe for the hundredth time. Or the thousandth time. That'd be wonderful too, I reckon. You see how glorious he is? He's the lion. How gracious he is? He's the lamb. I wonder, do you need to experience his stunning grace today? I know I do. Maybe for the first time. Maybe it's the first time that you're ever going to come to Jesus and say, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to your cross and what you did there, I, I'm going to hang on to that. That's what I want to take hold of by faith. Because that's my hope. How wonderful would that be if that's what you did today for the first time? Maybe for the hundredth time. Maybe pride has crept in. Maybe it's a good time to humble yourself again. In light of who Jesus is, the lion and the lamb, and experience his grace, it's amazing. In full awareness of your need. And I wonder if it's a good time for us all to see the privilege we have to live as sent ones, to carry the name of Jesus wherever we go and whatever we do. In our homes, in our parenting. What a great way of thinking about parenting. Carrying the name of Jesus to the next generation. Ah. In our relationships, in our workplaces, in our region. I heard recently someone said, when you move to an area, and obviously if you've been here for a while, you can just start doing this now. Go to the same coffee shop and the same petrol station and the same checkout as much as you can and get to know the people who are behind that counter. Because as you do that, you can carry the name of Jesus. I reckon if that landed for us, it would, it would kind of change things a bit. Not that we don't do that already, but I reckon it would spur us on to do it more. Why don't we pray together? Gracious Father, thank you so much for what you've done for us in the Lord Jesus. We are stunned by your grace that we don't deserve and we know what we do deserve. And you haven't given us what we deserve. You've given us in Jesus your rich mercy and grace and love and blessing father we thank you so much for this we recognize that it was incredibly costly for the lion to also be the lamb the son of god god himself crucified for us please help us not to take that lightly even in a few moments as we come around the communion table Lord, I want to pray especially if we're here today and we haven't yet come to the real Jesus, the Jesus made known in the Scriptures, the one we've seen today, and we haven't put our faith and trust in him alone, not bringing anything to offer. Father, would you help us do that today if that's where we're at, that we might know you, and love you and enjoy you, be adopted as your children, and live a life as you intend in response. As we sing now, Lord, we ask that the words would be not just on our lips, but from our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen.